just want to thank you so much for coming um, and um, agreeing to do this masterclass with us. It's my pleasure. Um, I know all of us at Blue Down are really excited to have you. I'm excited to meet the team. Yeah, I definitely think it's going to be a really nice, that gig's going to be really amazing. So, I think it would be nice just to start off with you introducing yourself, maybe telling us your artist name and your practice and yeah, just a little bit about what you do. Uh, so my my artist name or the one that I go by when I do electronic music life is Laid Girl. Okay. Um, I um, well, I guess my background is initially in classical music in Spain. Yeah. Um, then I moved to the UK to not do classical music in Spain. <laughs> um, and then so I actually did a degree in music in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. uh, graduated in two thousand seventeen. And since um, I've been performing sort of my own solo set, um, which came about from mostly from um, material that I had in my final year that I made for and um, during my final year, and then which has been progressing ever since for three, four years now. Yeah, and great. new material that kind of has been gradually um, accumulating since. Cool. So I think. Um, it might be good just to have a look, like now to rec like listen to a little bit of that, and we've got a clip that we would like to show you. So we're going to show you some of that now. <laughs> Is this really necessary? Great transition. <laughs> Thank you. So, like, we were discussing, weren't we, about like the your practice and how that that come like the points that you orientate yourself around. And mm. I think we've found some like really good key points mm. that I think you want to share. So, like I was saying, for me, I think mostly actually through this song uh, was the discovery of textures, textures and sound. Yeah. Um, sometimes we think that electronic music has to sound this way or um, uh, might be what we call very meaty, very standardized and yeah. hyper produced, but that is not necessarily the case. And historically, it's not ever necessarily been the case. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of great uh, initial electronic artists that yeah. played with textures and were experimental with their sound. So I think that's really important with electronic music because it gives you the option of being able to suddenly make whatever you want. You don't have to go into this preset sound. You can, and even if you start with this preset sound, you can make so much out of it, really. You don't yeah. have to start with it. And I think it's that idea of it not being so perfect makes it a bit more fun mm. to play. I think that's what was, when I started recording my voice and like changing it around, it was more fun to play with that than a, like a totally perfect texture. Mm. Or, yeah, I suppose Perfect. it's a compromise because yeah. sometimes it's like, quite easy to resort to. Yeah. But it, um, I suppose also being able to record your own instruments and your own textures gives you immediately a sense of uh, connection with them. Yeah. That is not to say uh, there's great artists that just use uh, presets. Oh, and totally, I totally. absolutely love. It's just, yeah. it so happens that to me, that's part of my practice most of the times, not necessarily always, to start with textures. Do um, you have any artists that you would recommend listening to that use texture really beautifully? Uh, well, actually, somebody who I initially found myself being inspired enough to start my creative process like them was Hot Sugar, uh, which is kind of um, a sort of dark pop uh, in a Ooh. way, uh, who uses his own recorded materials. Yeah. Um, I've Sort of, not uh, not that I listen to him much now, but he was one of the uh, precursors for my practice itself. Then yeah. now I have, I listen quite a lot to Holly Herndon, who yeah. I've talked to you about. Yeah. Uh, and I think she is incredible. She's an icon and I want to be her. Yeah. Um, she, um, she essentially takes ownership 
of the technologies that she uses. And part of her music and her practice is a commentary on those technologies. And mm -hmm. uses it, uh, her platform, uh, to sort of have, uh, revindicate uh, political um, of ownership and emancipation, yeah. in, in a way. Uh, she uses a lot of her voice. Yeah. Uh, she does a lot of life processing and yeah. very sophisticated, very um, also intuitive. She's also she's a boundary between sound art and electronic music that she's managed to kind of like sit in very comfortably in the middle. Yeah. Um, she is, she's also an advocate for pop, uh, but also has huge experimental uh, techniques herself. Like she has created an AI to play with them, yeah. for instance. Then um, Holly Herndon, um, Lyra Primer, actually, she uses her voice and processes her voice, mm -hmm. which is something that you're, I guess you're really interested in doing. Yeah, so um, yeah, I amazing. think she would be an amazing person to talk um, to know more about. Um, she's also, yeah, she's a great thinker and translates that into her practice. So I look up to yeah. Electronic artists, normally queer female electronic artists, um, I have that tendency towards them. Um, and yeah, try to find what I like about them. Yeah. And sometimes I try to put it in my practice. Yeah. So yeah, I try to find resources around the people that, I guess that kind of creating your own references, your own system of references, rather than going into, I don't know, westernized types of music. What is it of somebody's practice, somebody's practice that you like? Yeah. Is it a bass riff? Is yeah. it um, the honesty in their voices? Is it what attributes do you actually like? Like, yeah. and then putting Taking them. It into your... yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. So I guess that's part of the second one, which is attention to sound. Yeah, um, which and I guess we expand on that a little bit more. Um, so um, I can part of my creative practice is being focused mm. super in detail. Mm. I can spend a long time just on three seconds of sound mm. and kind of in the process I sort of transform a little bit on my mindset I might actually just forget where I am and what I'm doing I'm just listening on repeat so much that um, part of me also gets transformed with the sound and then comfortably um, kind of play with it mm. and uh, yeah it's like um, I play with it and find myself being played with in a way yeah, so, that's um, beautiful. So, yeah, I would say that a lot of the time I, because I edit quite a lot of the sounds, mm. I listen to them for ages and repeat until I find something that motivates me, I guess. I think that's quite interesting, like the interaction with the sound and the self. Like, I think that it comes across in your music. Like, you have that interaction with each sound, and you've obviously, like, listened to it, and it's brought something to it and you've also changed it and manipulated it in a way which is mm. quite I find quite beautiful <laughs> thank you uh, I think that's part of the yeah. the, second, the third point which is letting sound files sound phrases um, have a life of their own so mm. that's misspelled um, so we won't let tell it, anybody <laughs> like we told everyone <laughs> everyone that knows so so to say it <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's part of where your control as the composer and musician sits and where do you let that um, detach from the ownership also being on um, that yeah. rather than having a linkage, just being separate from it and seeing it from a distance. Yeah. Um, so um, actually Lyra Primerk taught me this, I think. so. How did she explain it? Uh, exactly that, letting letting sound files sit on their own, have yeah. a life of their own. So yeah. she has a huge library of sounds that um, she she has worked with. And I I guess in that sense, it's what I was talking about, uh, listening, talking about before listening to hours of the same sounds and then mm. eventually you come, you find something that engages you. Um, and sometimes you don't need to use it up in that point. So saving it for a later time, having a library of sounds that you have created, that you have used, that you don't know where, what to do. Maybe they could be a great introduction. Maybe they could be a great bridge. Maybe they could become a different instrument on their own. 
um, maybe they will go nowhere or maybe you'll listen to them in a couple of years and think this this is going here for some reason do you have a time when you say okay well that's now and that's enough like how do you stop yourself just from going into that I guess that phrase of like ownership I think I often get too sucked into it and then I mm. stop being able to listen to the sound I'm actually just listening to what I think I'm listening you know mm. it's like a, it becomes a sort of cycle do you have methods to stop that or are you sort of just, um, is it just a self-reflection? I definitely struggle with it too. I definitely struggle finishing things and yeah. calling them complete. Um, um, I guess, let me think about this. I guess I, I save different versions in the process so yeah. that at least I am able to go back into something if I have regretted the, the change that mm. I've done to it. Um, so I guess that is safeguarding rather yeah. than an, <laughs> um, a remedy to it. But I suppose it's it's a hard one. It's a really hard one to, to say. Um, sometimes it's just having to stop, yeah. period, in just not just giving yourself some time just to take that yeah and i think part of the process is also just letting it aside and letting it sit yeah. in a library mm -hmm. and on its own for a little while yeah. um if because if i find myself being caught up in the loop of trying to process and process and edit something uh it's probably because i'm not entirely sure where it's going or there's other things that i have to be thinking about um so letting it sit and then going back to it is actually quite useful for that yeah um, I think you said something earlier when we were just like having a conversation about self-compassion in, in your mm. process and that's been something that I've been sort of trying to put into my work is like that idea of like I am allowed to just mm. believe it or mm. it's not yeah that is fine you know and I think it's interesting that it's actually more helpful sometimes to go away mm. so yeah yeah uh, yeah I definitely relate to that mm. I think that's why it's it's a priority of mine because yeah. I think at the beginning of my practice I was very um, self-doubting and not that I'm not anymore but I am aware that that is it can be a hindrance so yeah. it's a process to get yourself to actually enjoy what you're doing yeah. and to have uh, authority in your own voice really yeah. which is a lot of musicians is what we want really is we have something to say we have something to express and we do it through music so yeah. why then cut your own tongue when you're trying but um it's easier said than done i know i, I know yeah definitely, definitely <laughs> <I'm playing. laughs> um yeah so oh yeah playing with technical limitations not against them uh this is yeah kind the, of leading into that yes yeah it's about self-compassion it's um, and I think maybe more so if you are new to using uh, digital technologies, uh, you will have to immediately just figure out things that you don't understand. It might be very overwhelming. There's definitely not one way of doing things, but you definitely start thinking that your way is the wrong way. There's, this is, <laughs> I guess, Everybody will think that at one point. Um, so, yeah, I think in any learning process, you have to get um, rid of your own judgments, mm. else you won't be able to learn, else you won't be able to get sophisticated in something. It, it happens in any instrument, really. If, if you want to be sophisticated, you have to abandon any judgment and be self-compassionate. And I think with technologies, this is the same, this is the same issue. Uh, it's, another device is another instrument that you're using and um, you have to equally treat it res with respect but also don't um, think any less of you for not understanding something mm. and I think it's really important to understand that um, your practice is your own and it there's no right or wrong and there's actually quite it's quite um, quite a good thing to have an entirely different way of using if anything, even wrong way of using programs will, will also have a different outcome. Yeah. 
kind of a sense of failure being it. okay and, yeah. and different ways of doing it are yeah. important. Yeah. Are important. Cool. I like that about like a conduit for learning using that ability of like that's fine. It's not a problem, but it's not a problem that I can't do that specific, I don't know, crazy thing that I've seen yeah. other people do. And I just think enjoying that's the little processes. Yeah, it's a struggle, but um, this is how I think I've sort of reached a level of um, natural understanding with what I do is, mm. and my practice has come from having to maneuver my own limitation. Mm. So the the sound editing that I do were the, like me trying to understand how to do sound editing. And so through the process of failure, I have achieved that sort of practice. Yeah. So it is that uh, that's also really important. That is also your own in a way. It's almost that becomes you, those little imperfections and Yeah, 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 for sure. Um yeah, I think being willing to share with others um your process is really important. Uh, especially with well not especially but um electronic artists can be very insular, like you said before. Yeah. And um it's really good to have a bridge gap. Mm. I think it's really important. Music is about um, sharing, I think. Um, I think I've said this. Challenging your own musical preferences. I think electronic music is a great, great conduit to challenging quite a lot of kind of established ways of music making. Um, or being aware of the ones that are conditioning you. So blank canvas to direct your creative process in ways that don't necessarily have to abide the ones that you've learned or yeah. the ones that you think are good. Yeah. Does it have to, like, if you're in a major key, do you have to stick to this major key and maybe go to the fifth, um, to the relative of that key? Do you have to go to the minor relative? Do you have to then conclude the same way? Do you have to have an A, bridge, B? Do you have yeah. to have a chorus? Can you break those things or why do you want those things? Um, yeah. And why do you want to preserve those things in music, in electronic music? Um, I think, yeah, there's quite a lot of potential in electronic music and this is worth uh, thinking about. And finally, especially being organized with your own files. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, sounds very, it sounds very trivial, but uh, my God, if I could think of the amount of things that I've lost, yeah that i am very uh, attached to but just there's no way of going back to saving yeah. those files because yeah. i saved them in a wrong place and moved the folders and just try to be try to compartmentalize and try to be tidy about the files and yeah. uh, projects that you do so yeah let's begin by using a a sound recording um so I'll use any. This is my library of sounds, by the way. Um, drag it on. Bring it back to the beginning. As you can see, the name has already been put on the audio. I really like the texture of fire. So. Um, the way that I might start is by adding some cue and really, really changing it. So an EQ changes like the playing the frequency. EQ will normally just enhance certain. Uh, it's normally used to enhance certain qualities of the sound. So vocals, you will uh, have a different EQ that will normally enhance tiny bits of higher frequencies. Will lower down tiny bits of middle frequencies, and might take out some of the um, lower frequencies altogether. Um, but I use EQ for textures quite a lot to bring um, a frequency really high on, mm. on the sound spectrum. Um, 
and you can still you still preserve the quality of the sound, but mm. you might not even realize that its origin was the fire at all. Um. And so here you might be already good. And then I might cut this little bit. Let's delete that, we don't need that. And I'll create a sample instrument, for instance. Um, so this is, it seems quite complicated, but what I do is go into this little bit over here, hey, and bring this snippet. Whoops. No? Hmm, doesn't want So now I've got that tiny snippet of sound that I've made. And I can sort of use it, um, I can reverse it a little bit. Uh, I can already get a keyboard out and see what it sounds like on its own. I might decide that I don't like it. I might start recording something from it. Um, maybe the higher frequencies are uh, more interesting than the lower ones. Um, this can be one way of creating your instruments. So taking a little snippet and just with a simply adding a hard EQ to it, you might already find uh, something interesting from it. Okay, so then uh, we go back to Ableton. Um, so I am not saying that people should use to... Um, uh, DAW? Yes, at all. And this is just the way that I started um, and kind of organically went into. Um, so everybody will have a different practice. Uh, this is the one, the one that uh, I have in my live sets. And in fact, it says radio sets because this is I decided to, from having three different um, separate songs, I put them all in the same set so that I could uh, kind of go back and forth from each of them. So let me help that a little bit. Um, as you can see, there's. I kind of have colored them to the songs in themselves and have named them by the, the time signature and the BPM. So the first one is in 90 BPM, which is the what I have here. I will transition into uh, an 120 BPM during the live set and will choose a specific sound that might not kind of um, sound or be influenced by the quickening of the BPM um, so that I can transition into a quicker sound without. So what kind of sound is that? Any sound that it doesn't have a, a, a uh, kind of cyclical rhythm to yeah. them to it. Okay. Um, could be, for instance... <laughs> So I've just actually expanded. Um, so essentially, this is the whole song, uh, which we've just had a look at very briefly on Logic. I um, so you can see that there's a lot less tracks than before, mm -hmm. and this to me is quite convenient. This mm -hmm. is just one version. Uh, there's there's other Ableton versions, and some of them have more, some of them have less. And I'm actually in the process of kind of rechanging a little bit, but. Uh, you can see that it has been simplified. Um, so this is what I was talking about, um, finding a moment, a snippet of meaning in the kind of melodies that I have and kind of using them to play with them live. And so, um, 
So Ableton has two, um, in the horizontal part of Ableton, there's uh, where the, if it's an audio track, uh, where the sound file is, and the qualities of the sound file, the sample, this is here, and this is the sound file. And it also, if you go over here, there's uh, where you can put your audio effects. This I use quite a lot um, to play live. So essentially, the edited sound that I've created will then become edited again in a live setting. Mm. Um, and I can play around with it as much as I please and do entirely different parts and entirely different songs just with playing with effects and uh, kind of combining them with the rest. Uh, not all of the sounds sound well together, but uh, this is also part of figuring out what you want and what you want. Not. So the, the good thing about Ableton is that it's made to be played live and it's created in loops. Uh, I have many objections about just having loops. There's a lot of, kind of things that you miss out on, but it's also very easy to play with. Logic also has this way of playing in which every snippet of sound is independent from each other. You can play them at the same time. Um, it also, if you're playing sounds vertically, then you will only be able to play one at a time. You can't play two of them as soon as you do the one, the other one stops, but not if you're in a different track. And then you've got uh, the sort of master triggering, so you can trigger scenes there for it. Um, so you can tailor it into having an intro part and actually la labeling them for your own uh, understanding a little bit more of what you're doing. So there's my pitch for name intro. And in fact, you stop. This is sort of the intro that I begin with in the song. And I sometimes use it, sometimes don't. Uh, this we will rename, uh, let's call it Paris, because it kind of is. And when I feel like it, I can trigger a scene. room to play despite yeah. the fact that in this case there's what like 14 snippets of sound yeah. there's 14 snippets of sounds that you can then develop into many ways um would you be able to quickly show us the transition between time signatures i'd be quite interested to see that yeah um let's see this one i actually use um yeah i actually Ableton also allows you to uh, crossfade from one part to another and sometimes I use that to my advantage to transition into things 
like I said, I have to do it intuitively and sometimes at the risk of failure and sometimes um, it works, sometimes it doesn't, it's part yeah. of it being life. So I don't have a specific set, but yeah. I don't think it's, um, that I sing along to it so this is why sometimes I simplify quite a lot in the case of this song I'm singing so much all the time that it would be it is a nightmare to do both things at the same time quite often um, so I just uh, restrict what I am doing to sort of be able to do both things at the same time I, um, yeah this is a little effect that I use a lot I love it um, there's, there's plenty presets. I am not one that uses a lot of external plugins. Exam plugins are kind of things that you can download yourself and um, you can actually either pay for them or uh, have them. There's free versions of them. Uh, some people have huge amounts of banks, but um, I've kind of just simplified my practice so that I don't have to deal with a lot of um, problems. Um, but yeah. So this would be another song and this would, could be the first song sample that I start with. Do you know if you're interested in problems that you play with? Um, it, I guess it changes and I am starting to play with more different ones, I suppose. Um, like I said, I've never really composed in Ableton. I've composed with Logic before, but uh, the, I've got this ones, uh, which I've shown to you before. So, let's see. Specific delay that can also add textures. I feel like I've learnt a lot in that every time I talk to you something else comes out. I like the transitions between timings and just watching the way that you EQ'd like that one spike. 
mm. like taking that one bit of frequency up that mm. was because I've like taken the bottom bits and the top bits out so mm. I think that's been really interesting mm. um, I'm sure a lot of producers will uh, say what are you doing what are you EQ? doing um, and there's and you can learn as much technique as you want about EQing yeah. and processing and production I've definitely done a lot of that and would um, d apply kind of like but it's also like breaking the rules because exactly. I've yeah. like heard about taking out frequencies just to get out the resonant frequencies mm, yeah. but then breaking that Give rule them space. giving them space but then breaking that rule and saying oh what is actually the really interesting frequency that we want, we want to hit that mm. wants to come right to the front mm. I think that's really interesting well, thank you so much for watching and we hope you learned something as well as me. And I hope maybe you learned something in discussing your process as well. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to have to consider a lot of things. <laughs> and I, I hope it's, it's been yeah. useful. And we hope you enjoy the gig as well. Thank you. Bye. In a bit. <laughs>